good evening to you and welcome to the National Concert Hall to this event under the auspices of the Dublin Writers Festival. Tonight we're going to hear from two people who have a great admiration for and great connection with each other and to whom radically different and indeed also common reading publics owe steadfast allegiance. Ian McCune, as you all know, is a multi-award winning novelist. His best-known prize uh, being the Booker in 1998 for Amsterdam. His most recent being the Bollinger Everyman Woodhouse Prize for comic fiction, uh, as a consequence of uh, which he is now the proud owner of a pig, uh, which is called after the novel Solar. Um, and his latest novel, which is Solar, is yet another in a lengthening line of remarkable artistic achievements. It deals with Nobel physics laureate Michael Beard, who's a late convert to climate change and who attempts in his own uniquely unattractive way to save the planet while making a large fortune for Michael Beard. Stuart Brand is the antithesis of the fictional Mr. Beard. He's been an ecologist and committed environmentalist all his adult life and is the author of the Whole Earth Catalogue, begun in 1968 and which the Apple Chief Executive Officer Steve Jobs has described as Google 35 years early. In his uh, latest work, Whole Earth Discipline, he's argued that in the face of potentially catastrophic climate change and the continuing deterioration in the Earth's resources, the environmental movement needs to reverse its stance on issues like nuclear power and genetically modified organisms. Would you please welcome our distinguished guests, Ian McCune and Stuart Brand. Uh, now, these two gentlemen, as I say, know each other very well. Uh, so, you look, think upon me, we were talking about this backstage, think upon me as a kind of a tennis net. Um, when the conversation gets interesting, I won't be getting involved. Uh, we'll let the two gentlemen at it. But what we're going to start off with, because we were also talking about this backstage, is first paragraphs. And uh, both Ian and Stuart are going to read uh, from their first paragraphs. But, uh, I mean, Stuart, you... Um, you, as far as you're concerned, Ian is the master of the first paragraph. I think he's raised it to a, a different level, and I'd love to hear him talk about that after we hear well, his current one. Perhaps you we'll want to hear mine? Work away. Climate change, urbanization, biotechnology. Those three narratives still taking shape are developing a long arc likely to dominate this century. How we frame them now will affect how they play out. Illusions abound on all three subjects, but their true nature is knowable. In the face of climate change, everybody's an environmentalist. That's tough, not just for people who've been comfortable thinking of themselves as anti-environmentalists. It's even tougher for longtime Greens. Activist Bill McKibben recently noted, the environmental movement has morphed steadily into the climate change movement. That means that Greens are no longer strictly the defenders of natural systems against the incursions of civilization, now they're the defenders of civilization against the incursion of a natural system, climate dynamics. It's a whiplash moment. When roles shift, ideologies have to shift, and ideologies hate to shift. The workaround is pragmatism, quote, a practical way of thinking concerned with results rather than with theories and principles. The shift is deeper than moving from one ideology to another. The shift is to discard ideology entirely. We're still realizing how much radical rethinking we will need to comprehend the forces now loose in the world and figure out how to deal with them. The scale of forces this time is planetary, the scope is centuries, the stakes are what we call civilization, and it is all taking place at the headlong speed of accelerating human technologies and climate turbulence. Talk of saving the planet is overstated, however. Earth will be fine, no matter what, so will life. It is humans who are in trouble, but since we got ourselves into this fix, we should be able to get ourselves out of it. Ian, first paragraphs. For, before you read your first paragraphs, Stuart wants to t you to talk about first paragraphs. Well, I have a little first paragraph envy problem of my own in relation to Stuart, uh, because 
as you hear in that clarion call right from the beginning, here is a man with practical solutions to propose uh, to genuine problems. And as a novelist, I have no solutions. Uh, I simply wish to reflect, meditate on human nature in, in the face of a, a unique problem. Uh, it's a great chasm, in a sense, between us. Uh, we come at this from very different um, points of view, in, in the sense that I know that if I were to take in a novel like this, um, a, a fierce uh, positional thrust to persuade a reader of a certain position, the novel would die. Um, novels do not, on the whole, flourish when they wish to make a case. Mm. And yet, Stuart is out to make a case, and he makes it incredibly eloquently. So, for that reason, uh, the inner life uh, features uh, more, of course, in, in a fiction than in a non-fiction. He belonged to that class of men, vaguely unprepossessing, often bald, short, fat, clever, who are unaccountably attractive to certain beautiful women. Or he believed he was, and thinking seemed to make it so. And it helped that some women believed he was a genius in need of rescue. But the Michael Beard of this time was a man of narrowed mental condition, anhedonic, monothematic, stricken. His fifth marriage was disintegrating, and he should have known how to behave, how to take the long view, how to take the blame. Weren't marriages, his marriages, tidal, with one rolling out just before another rolled in? But this one was different. He did not know how to behave. Long views pained him, and for once there was no blame for him to assume, as he saw it. It was his wife who was having the affair, and having it flagrantly, punitively, certainly without remorse. And he was discovering in himself, among an array of emotions, intense moments of shame and longing. Patrice was seeing a builder, their builder, the one who had repointed their house, fitted their kitchen, retiled their bathroom, the very same heavy-set fellow who in a tea break had once shown Michael a photo of his mock Tudor house, renovated and Tudorized by his own hand, with a boat on a trailer under a Victorian-style lamppost on the concreted front driveway and space on which to erect a decommissioned red phone box. Beard was surprised to find how complicated it was to be the cuckold. Misery was not simple. Let no one say that this late in life he was immune to fresh experience. Ian, what, what, do, you, what do you work at with a when you write a first paragraph for a novel, are you planting a hook? Are you taking us inside the mind of a protagonist right away? What are you up to? Well, I think the simplest answer to that is, I honestly don't know. Um, I'm a great believer in writing uh, irresponsible first paragraphs. Uh, I pretend that I'm going to write a novel and that this is the first paragraph. Hmm. But I, also, I know it's a pretense. I'm not really going to, I, I have no duties to perform after this first paragraph. And in that way, I hope sooner or later, and it could take months and, and many such paragraphs, that I will trick myself into writing something that hooks me. I'm not thinking about a reader. I have to just produce something that I like the taste of, the tone of, that seems pregnant with something that I can't quite define and uh -huh. won't go away weeks later. So I have none of the responsibilities that you have mm. to the real world. Uh, I have to just enter a state of hesitancy and ignorance uh, out of which I hope to. So do you have a great see. stash of these paragraphs somewhere that <laughs> yeah, there was a, there was simmering away? And then... No, all the ones that die, they die. Uh, and the only ones that live are the ones that then become eventually a novel. And they're not, often they're not the first paragraph of the novel, they end up you know, in the, right in the middle, mm. as in the case here. Uh, the first paragraph I wrote in just this 
experimental way is the opening of the second part of the novel, um, which is you know, just about, uh, it, yes, this, I, I wrote this one sentence and I thought, oh, well, this, where would this go? And it was, he was running out of time. And I thought, ah, could be a novel about climate change. And so, <laughs> only a novelist would make that, John. Can I, can I just ask, both because we were, were talking about this uh, backstage, the issue of fiction versus non-fiction, Stuart, mm. and which has most to contribute to the debate on climate change? You know, it's funny. We all thought the debate was over yeah. about two years ago. We did, but it's and, not. Uh, and lo and behold, it's not. And Ian is now being quoted by people on both sides of the debate. That's not happening with my book. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's, I mean, wasn't it Freud who said denial precedes acceptance? You sort of have to state the thing and say you really, really don't believe in it until you do. Uh, something like that seems to be going on. I was in uh, Hodges Vegas yesterday, and the, the shelf of climate books, which is rather large, is now about half saying just a damn minute about climate. Um, so the, you know, the, it, we got all the books saying climate is going to be terrible and Al Gore and all that, and now we're getting the books that are saying, well, maybe either not so terrible or maybe it's all a hoax or this kind of thing. So it's an interesting debate, but it's a debate which gets all mixed up between the scientific debate, which is real, doing science is argument, that's what it's all about, and the political debate, which to my eye is unreal, and is, but is very strong because the scientists don't doubt each other's program or agenda, but the denialists who think that the Greens, for example, who, are, who love the idea of calamity, um, that we all want to change people's behavior and that's our real program and we're just using climate as a way to make everybody become socialists or something. And so they're against that or they're against Al Gore because he's a Democrat. And then that plays out in this whole other drama, psychodrama that plays out politically. And, but the people doing that psychodrama are quoting scientists at each other who are not in that political drama. So it gets all confused. And then there's some paid hacks on both sides who confuse it even further, because they're just saying whatever they get paid to say. Ian, fiction or non-fiction? Well, I'm not sure that fiction can really contribute anything to the climate change debate. Uh, I think literature, if one could think of it broadly as an examination of human nature, and one of its central functions is that, could at least look at human nature in relation to this unique problem. Mm. Uh, and human nature, of course, is, is a vast subject. Who we are, and we're still, we never agreed who we are, and what we are is constantly changing in relation to the conditions we find ourselves in. But there are at least uh, some polarities. Uh, we are... I think, exceedingly clever as an ape. We harnessed the burning of fossil fuels to make machines that will do our work um, for us or the work of animals. Along the way, we've created another problem, uh, climate change, related problems of CO2 emissions and so on. And we're gonna have to exercise our cleverness in relation to this. Think of Copenhagen. Uh, last year in December. Perhaps unprecedented in, in history, science, rationality summoned every single nation on earth who was represented mm -hmm. in that town. When everyone was assembled, some other side of human nature got in the way. A sort of atavistic self-interest, cabals, secret alliances, uh, the grandstanding that occurs when alpha males, and they were mostly males, all assembled in one place. Um, and it ended in tears and fast to some extent. Hmm. And uh, it's, it's for that reason that I was just going through the final draft of this book at the time that I decided that 
uh, since this book ended in August of 2009, I would invite my chaotic hero to Copenhagen because he so much represented its spirit. So I think if we can make any contribution, it's, it's, it's only along that it has to be in terms of the emotional life, the life that people lead at the interpersonal level uh, and how um, that rackety nature uh, finds this problem so difficult. We think in the short term, we're being asked to think in the long term. We do, we return favors to people who do us favors. Here we're being asked to do favors for people we will never meet, our great, great grandchildren, uh, all against our natures. And yet, you know, we are at least conf confronting it, even if we're not solving it. I know both of you are interested in discussing cultural pessimism versus what I think you call scientific optimism. So do you right. want to start off on that? Ian, I detect as you become, how long is your writing career now? A couple of decades, a few decades. Four, and four you, decades. Yeah. You've adopted more and more of the sort of scientific frame of reference in your later books, um, especially Saturday and, and, and Solar. And they seem less uh, automatically pessimistic to me. They're still ironic in all the good things that novelists will do. And then, I mean, this one jumped all the way over into satire, hence your comedy award. Um, have you become more optimistic, do you think, as a writer and as a person? I think pessimism is partly, at least, a luxury uh, of youth. Uh, when you think you're never going to die, uh, and I, indeed, I often thought in my 20s that maybe I'd be made an exceptional. Uh, in this respect, that it happened to old people, but it might not happen to me. And I think this was a generational problem, too, of us baby boomers. We thought we'd never get old. Uh, then I could lay about me. I had fantasies of nuclear holocaust in which I heroically survived. I mean, um, and it was delicious. And then two things happened. Uh, I had children, and I got older and my remaining years shrink uh, mm. all the time and I begin to want the human project to succeed. And I'm not sure that makes me more optimistic, it just makes me look around for the, for the positive signs that I could possibly um, either cling to or encourage. But certainly among, in the humanities generally, we love pessimism. It is our badge. We, we know it to be intellectually delicious. Uh, we wallow in it. Uh, an intellectual who wasn't fundamentally pessimistic uh, would be accused of uh, being an airheaded fool, I think. Um, and that's why I rather like the company uh, of scientists and men like Stuart, because they also see that there are huge problems confronting humanity, but when they see a problem, they start to cast around for a solution. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, on the whole, um, in the arts. We, we like uh, to write novels, well, like The Road, for example. Mm -hmm. And actually, I have to say, this is not a very optimistic novel. I mean, it all ends in tears for Michael Beard and his project of saving the planet. Uh, it's hard to resist in the humanities. But I think the Green Movement, at least since 1980 or so, um, adopted a romantic stance, understandable in the sense that part of my understanding of how the romantic stance works is an identification with some great force of nature. If some, somebody is hiking or I mean, Rousseau actually did go out in the woods. It was in town once, and he developed the whole theory of how you know, natural humanity would behave in the woods. He had the faintest idea what he was talking about. The French Revolution was based on it and so on, all in illusion. But the romantic stance has this emotional attachment and a, um, a suspicion of all that is clearly rational. And indeed, part of the fun of being a romantic is defying reality. And so having this declinist view that that uh, civilization is going to hell, society is going to hell, Europe's going to hell, Ireland is going to hell, whatever. 
uh, because there's the bad people and bad ideas and bad institutions that are taking us away from this uh, good way that we used to be. And so that part of environmentalism is, is in a sense very conservative, very nostalgic, very backward looking. And anything new, new technology, any changes in the situation are regarded uh, in kind of apocalyptic terms. We're going to have a population uh, J curve that will crush us all, or we're going to have a, a climate change situation that will uh, take humanity back to almost nothing. And a fair amount of environmentalists go, good, about time. We deserve it. And I find that uh, repellent. So what you have now is scientists coming into the picture who have the sort of basic optimism of science, which is that science is always getting better. It, it looks for interesting problems and then basically figures out what's really going on in that domain and moves on. And it's inarguable because they, they don't win an argument until they have better evidence than the other side, which is not the case in literary criticism, as no. I can tell. No. And that's one of the reasons I got out of the humanities as my major in, in college, because I didn't want to have everything based on somebody's opinion. I wanted science where opinion is part of the story, but only part of the story. But the thing which is happening now in the environmental movement is the engineers are coming along who don't give a damn about any of that. And they have nothing like a tragic view that you were just describing. The whole point of tragedy is that it can't be solved. I think there's for many people an attraction of climate is this huge tragic thing that civilization has brought on itself and can't be solved. And the engineers say, well, actually, it can. You know, it is geoengineering. There's things we can do with this, things we can do with that. Next generation of nuclear, uh, nice clean energy, scalable. It's going to be cheap. Uh, let's just get on with it. But you're not mm. supposed to be able to fix a tragedy. But we also must be a little cautious about these fixes. Because um, sometimes they pile in uh, with ideas that 30 years later begin to look terrible. Uh, think of, uh, I don't know, one could reach in all kinds of directions, agricultural practices in the late 1940s. Uh, terrible things were done to the English countryside, and I'm sure it happened in Ireland too, by rationalists and planners saying, well, this river which has flooded this field forever could now be coated in concrete, turned right. into a sluice, and made to run straight, and you can increase your yield. And so the water meadows of, of, of the country disappeared. Or when, the when rationalists and scientists and, yeah. got themselves mixed up in childcare and said in the 1920s and 30s, when your baby cries, do not pick it up. It'll be bad for it. Uh, and a generation of mothers were convinced. So. That's why I think we need skeptics of all sort, um, even in the climate debate. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You've challenged green, or what you could probably call green orthodoxy. Maybe mm -hmm. you could just, there, there are sort of five central points, I think, that you, that you make. Just briefly go through them. I think, I mean, uh, uh, Ian wants to address uh, some of them anyway. Well, the, the way in which I'm you have challenged uh, that orthodoxy. Cities are green. Uh, nuclear power is green, transgenic crops, genetic engineering is green. Uh, the population explosion is turning into the population implosion. It's going from a problem of too many people towards a problem of too few people. And uh, geoengineering, direct intervention in the climate at planetary scale may well be necessary. Um, just that's, take, that's, just take, take one of those. Take, take uh, nuclear power. You've gone the same route as, for example, James Lovelock. No, Jim Lovelock has always been in favor of nuclear because he worked with uh, radioactive isotopes when he was back mm. in his, during his medical career 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, I was against nuclear on the grounds of not thinking about it or studying it very much uh, and kind of knee-jerking that of we must not burden future generations of this planet for 10,000 years with our poisonous waste of our industrial blah, blah, blah. And um, so I got to change my mind on that. And indeed, this book wound up being basically a book about how to change your mind about things. And so I'm not particularly interested in my opinion. It's a journalistic book that is putting out the kinds of things that either changed my opinion or 
I saw would move people's opinions when they dealt with the actual information, the actual data. So it, it's a book about how anybody might want to change their opinion if they have some suspicions about something, um, such as genetic engineering. Just go ahead and look at the biology the way a biologist does, which I was trained as an ecologist at Stanford. And uh, everything changes once you get inside these domains and look out. It's what I would wish everybody who has agendas in the world, including environmentalists, to when a new technology comes along, instead of figuring out all the reasons that it's probably bad for people, just go ahead and embrace it. Get inside it, look at the world from there, and then decide if it's harmful. Because then any critique you have will be an informed critique instead of an ignorant critique, which mine was of nuclear. And um, you may well decide this is a useful tool, but it's going in the wrong direction. Let's redirect this tool toward better things for humanity. You also have a most un-Walden-like approach to urbanization. Urbanization is green. That was another switch for me. The whole Earth catalog was seen by many as a back to the land, back to basics, and it was. And we had a lot of do-it-yourself civilization stuff in there. But what I saw in the 60s and then on into the 70s is many of us liberal arts undergraduates went off to try to reinvent civilization and had not a clue. We thought we could garden by throwing seeds at the ground and, and sort of doing something spiritual. <laughs> Boy, does that not work. Um, so we went out, we did rural communes, got hideously bored. Uh, it was, all the work fell on the women who got really tired of that. They left. The men lasted typically two months after that, and then they left. And the whole rural phenomenon just uh, vanished for us, and we all, went, all the hippies went into business, which we were good at. Um, Part of that had been based on the romantic notions, some of which was, I think, invented in the British Isles, or Ruskin and people like that, of uh, that rural is the base of all good. And Gandhi said that in India. But rural is the base of all boredom. Um, you know, here we are in Dublin because it is way more interesting than you know, some place one may have grown up. And by the by, we are much greener here. We use less materials, less energy than people who live in the countryside. That's here in the developed world. In the developing world, people who move to town, which they are doing at the rate of 1.3 million a week, uh, they're leaving behind subsistence farming, which is a poverty trap and an ecological disaster. And the, especially in the tropics, the landscape is growing back over those now abandoned subsistence farms. And it is a fabulously green event. Plus, the people are getting out of poverty starting in the slums, but that's normal. I mean, Dublin, I assume, was a shanty town at some particular point. I know San Francisco was. And uh, you know, by and by, they are gentrifying. And uh, so the news is good, both economically and ecologically, in cities, I believe. Ian, I know that <clears throat> something that surprised you about uh, uh, Stewart's book was population, his take on population. Yes, I mean, I, I was very persuaded years ago in the early 70s by Paul Ellick's book on population, and it seemed a very straightforward Malthusian calculation. It's rising exponentially, uh, and as more uh, food and resources became available to people, uh, the population would be unstoppable and grow at an alarming rate. So I was amazed to discover, I haven't read demographics uh, for a very long time to get an extraordinary summary in, in Stuart's book. The fact that in uh, many, many, or nearly all of the developed world, uh, population is well below replacement level, uh, at crisis level, and you know, heavily dependent uh, to, to maintain both the workforce and vitality in their culture in, on uh, immigration, inward immigration. And that even in the developing world, uh, as people move to cities as, uh, and children become less of a resource and more of a liability, it's much better to have one or two children in a city, uh, much more useful if you're in a subsistence farmer to have as many children as possible to help, to help you out. So uh, it does raise another problem. Oh, no, not a problem, a question. Because what, what's the right number of people? 
I mean, uh, in all our discussions of climate change and uh, dark scenarios, apart from sea level, which, I mean, sea level that we have is perfect sea level, uh, as you say, uh, because that's where we've built our cities. Uh, everything else seems, you know, what is the right temperature? Uh, how many people should live on this island or, or in the United States or all of Brazil? If more and more people are moving to the, to the city, and I think you have a figure like something like 80% of humanity. Um, developed countries typically are 80%. The mm. expectation is by mid-century, all the developing countries will have done about the same. Well, this opens up per in the world. perversely for the romantic imagination, suddenly the notion that uh, wildernesses could return, mm -hmm. uh, especially if we resist industrializing our countryside by throwing up wind turbines across <laughs> it. Um, which is a real danger that, again, in a first wave of, of, of super rationality, we put wind turbines everywhere and turn our countryside into concrete access roads and chain link fences. So there's a, uh, the imagination suddenly springs to attention that uh, the possibility that humanity uh, their numbers are going to go into sharp decline after mid-century. But I mean, is that not, simplistically, is that not a good thing? We're led to believe that it is rampant population explosion which has given rise to much of the uh, human-induced climate change. So, you know, if there are fewer people, well then maybe we'll be able to get that under control. I think that's right. The, uh, I'll make a book recommendation here. I wish I'd had it when I was writing this book, a new book by Fred Pierce. He's a new scientist writer. Uh, I think it's called People Quake here in the States. The title is rather better. It's called The Coming Population Crash and, um, and the Planet's Future. And he really nails uh, the main event going on, which I had just alluded to, which is that basically women are now running the population story. And by moving to town, they are freed up to, um, especially in the developing world, get free of the jerk they're stuck with, if that, they decide that's the case to uh, not be obeying the, the village elder or the family elder, but actually build their own lives, to uh, improve their education, to uh, develop jobs, community-based organizations, and so on. And uh, Fred Pierce's point is that basically this urbanization I was just talking about is being run largely by women uh, who are doing it. And some of them, we, a lot of them we see, you know, they're living in the slum, a billion people live in slums, another, another billion are expected, they're doing the work of uh, maids and nannies and cooks and whatnot. Uh, they're coming up and they're building everything that we use, it's made in China. Um, and in the course of that, they have fewer children. But they educate the children this time. And so what you have is, is a vast demographic change that liberated women in cities are bringing about. And it's all pretty much good news with this, to me, environmental advantage of lowering the population pressure. If carrying capacity of the world goes down because of climate change, which it may well do, uh, it would be nice to have fewer people bashing against that, which has been our history ever since the chimpanzees, is that humans ever fecund to come up against carrying capacity and then kill each other over the food that's left. Um, it would be nice not to have that as much. But when it really goes negative, which it is in places like Eastern Europe, you get total permanent depression in both the economic and, and the psychological sense. So one would like to have a softer landing than that. Um, and so I, my own feeling is that a, a kind of a progressive environmentalist view now would be kind of gently pronatal. So that, I mean, the, what, what you're looking for is 2.1 children per woman in order to have an absolutely even. Uh, it's been above that for a while, and that's why we had the population explosion. It's now below that in places like, uh, in most of Europe, it's down like 1.4 children per woman, which is an extinction number. Extraordinarily in France, and we're always led to believe that France is, you know, that the, they, they keep the population. No, it's actually 1.98. They it's actually that. closer to the... To they the, uh, pay large sums to have children in France. It sort of works. In America, we do it by having lots of churchgoers and lots of immigrants. Um, the worst deal is to um, have your population going down and at the same time be a fairly xenophobic 
culture. Mm -hmm. um, then you really compound things, and Japan is a prime instance of the, uh, you know, probably the first so, one to crash in its population. Yeah, what you've got is a situation where basically the global north, the developed world, is uh, in this situation demographically. So you've got old cities full of increasingly old people. And for 30 years or so, the global south is brand new cities growing rapidly full of young people. Where do you think the action is going to be? So I think there is a, an inversion. The rise of the west is over. The largest cities in the world are no longer Paris and London and New York. They are uh, Lagos and Mumbai and, and Sao Paulo and places like this. That's where the action is. So it's going to be an interesting time. But only uh, yeah, we got used to a thousand years of the success of the rise of the West. And, uh, but their, their population decline will catch up with them too. With and they will eventually find the same situation that Japan did, which is when you run out of young people, your uh, prosperity suddenly stops or levels off or gets in trouble. But this is all futurology we're involved in here. Mm. And but when I was a child and I didn't want, I, I think of any future situation, I used to think of all the bad things that could happen on the assumption that one was never right about the future. That's correct. And it was always a surprising thing that That's happened. Correct. So if I covered all the bad things, only the good things could happen. But generally, futurology has a pretty poor record, doesn't it? We're not very good at gazing into Even our Even demographic, future. which is as good as it gets, usually, you know, the demo demography is destiny, as they say, but they have missed a lot of important things. But no one even guessed the internet or mobile phones or, I mean, there's so much. The futurologists of 1950 uh, all had us in Dan Dare suits and personal helicopters. Um, it never came. Thank God. It's wonderful to look at uh, old Tomorrow's World programs oh, from yeah. the 1960s, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, before um, throwing it open to the audience to ask questions, you, uh, you want to do a, a reading, um, and you're, you have a guest, a guest artist appearing on my left, uh, so maybe you'd introduce this for us. Okay, well, this really takes us back to climate change, uh, skepticism, and confusion. Michael Beard, a physicist who's become rather uh, self-interestedly involved in climate change and has 18 patents in uh, a process known as artificial photosynthesis, has met up with his American business associate, uh, Toby Hammer. And uh, it's the night before the grand opening of their uh, prototype in the New Mexican desert of uh, turning water into hydrogen and oxygen to run a fuel cell generator. In other words, they're going to be, uh, they have a process that will cheaply make hydrogen and uh, put in their, uh, in the way of civilization, uh, free, virtually free and very clean energy. But um, Toby Hammer is troubled. Then Hammer leaned forward and said confidentially, as though the sole waiter on the far side of the restaurant might hear him, The chief, you can be straight with me. Tell me, is it true the planet's getting cooler? What? You keep telling me the arguments are over, but they're not. I, I'm hearing it everywhere. Last week, some woman professor of atmospheric studies or something was saying so on public television. Whoever she says she is, she's wrong. I'm hearing it everywhere, from business people. It seems like it's building. They're saying the scientists have gotten it wrong, but don't dare to admit it. Too many careers and reputations on the line. What's their evidence? They're saying a 0.7 degree rise since pre-industrial times, that's 250 years, is negligible, well within usual fluctuations. And the last 10 years have been below the average. We've had some bad winters here. That doesn't help our cause. They're also saying that too many people are going to get rich on the Obama handouts and tax breaks to want to tell the truth. Then there are all these scientists, including the one I was talking about, who signed up to the Senate Minority Report on climate change. You must have seen this stuff. Beard hesitated, then called for more wine. That was the trouble with some of these Californian reds. They were so smoothly accessible. They went down like lemonade but they were 16% alcohol. He could not help feeling that this conversation was beneath him. It wearied him, like talking about or against religion or 
crop circles and UFOs for that matter. He said, it's 0.8 now. It's not negligible in climate terms. And most of it has happened in the last 30 years. And 10 years is not enough to establish a trend. You need at least 25. Some years are hotter, some are cooler than the year before. And if you drew a graph of average yearly temperatures, it would be a zigzag, but a rising zigzag. When you take an exceptionally hot year as your starting point, you can easily show a decline, at least for a few years. That's an old trick called framing or cherry picking. As for these scientists who sign some contrarian document, they're in a minority of a thousand to one, Toby. Ornithologists, epidemiologists, oceanographers and glaciologists, salmon fishermen and ski lift operators. The consensus is overwhelming. Some weak-brained journalists write against it because they think it's a sign of independent thinking. And there's plenty of attention out there for a professor who will speak against it. There are bad scientists, just like there are rotten singers and terrible cooks. Hammer, Hammer. looks skeptical. If the place isn't hotting up, we're fucked. <laughs> As he refilled his glass, Beard thought how strange it was that after being associates for all these years, they had rarely discussed the larger issue. They had always concentrated on the business, the matter in hand. Beard also noticed that he himself was close to being drunk. Look, here's the good news. The UN estimates that already a third of a million people a year are dying from climate change. Bangladesh is going down because the oceans are warming and expanding and rising. There's drought in the Amazonian rainforest. Methane is pouring out of the Siberian permafrost. There's a meltdown under the Greenland ice sheet that no one really wants to talk about. Amateur yachtsmen have been sailing the Northwest Passage. Two years ago, we lost 40% of the Arctic summer ice. Now the eastern Antarctic is going. The future has arrived, Toby. Yeah, I guess. You're not convinced. Here's the worst case. Suppose the near impossible. The thousand are wrong. The one is right. The data are all skewed. There's no warming. It's a mass delusion among scientists, or a plot. Then we still have the old standbys, energy security, air pollution, peak oil. No one's going to buy a fancy panel from us just because the oil's going to run out in 30 years. What's wrong with you? Trouble at home? Nothing like that. Just that I put in all this work, then guys in white coats come on TV to say the planet's not heating. I'm spooked. Beard laid a hand on his friend's arm, a sure sign that he was drunk. Toby, listen, it's a catastrophe. Relax. <laughs> uh, I think you can, you can hear from that, this man earned his pig. <laughs> And is Bollinger, and a, the collected works of P.G. Woodhouse, apparently. Collected work, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I, yeah, if you have nothing to do with it, if you don't want it, if you don't want to hang on to it, you know, anyway. It's 55 volumes, we, we're going to have to move house. <laughs> <laughs> I just put up new shelves, actually, there's plenty of room for them. Okay, right, let us throw us open to the audience. There are roving mics going around. I don't know what, yes, we're going to bring up the house lights, great, so we can actually see each other. Uh, which is very good. Uh, there is a question already here, right in the middle. So you might want to pass the microphone across. And there's another question there. <laughs> Gentleman there, just wave your hand, wave your hand around so you can see. It's just in there. So we can have two in a row. So we can keep them going. That's it, great, okay. Off you go, sir. So uh, my name's Graham Strouts, and I have a question for Stuart Brand, and uh, very much enjoyed your book, very challenging, but I noticed, I think I'm right, you only had one mention in the whole book of peak oil, and um, I was wondering why that was. I think you, your point was that it wouldn't be as bad as many people feel, and I wondered if you'd enlarge on that, because in addition to the four environmental um, uh, holy cows that you challenge, you know, peak oil could well have been a fifth one. Thank you. I worked for a while at Royal Dutch Shell in London, in Shell Center, and um, they were doing scenarios as a futurologist, you know, I'd do scenario planning, and I was there partly 
watching Shell do scenarios. And they did Shell scenarios very early on that they referred to as after oil. But they were thinking in 50-year terms. And what they know is that it's, it's not peak oil. It's more like plateau oil or sort of gradually rounded hill oil or however you want to put it. And all it means is that there's an incremental change going on in one of the fossil fuels. Nobody talks about peak coal. Um, and gas, uh, especially, thank goodness, the price has been going down on it lately because of fracking, as they say, which is getting um, formally unobtainable gas out of shale by the new technique. And this keeps happening because the technology keeps moving, discoveries keep occurring. Uh, there's similar debates about uranium. Oh my gosh, we don't have enough uranium to have the nuclear renaissance that you're talking about brand. Uh, so what are you going to do about that? And you know, I mean, you look more closely, and it's not the issue that it usually is put up as. But I'm impressed that so many people take peak oil, James Kunstler comes to mind, as a um, sort of excuse or a reason to want to have the whole world change a whole set of behaviors that this is the sort of thing the market is actually pretty good at. What we saw in the States this last year when for kind of arbitrary reasons the price of gas suddenly doubled. It's amazing the amount of behavior that will shift with nobody having to tell anybody to do anything when the price of a gallon of gas in the U.S. went from $2 a gallon to $4 a gallon. So they got smaller cars again. The Hummer disappeared as a brand from the world. Uh, the Humvee, the big meaningless cars. And I think that peak oil is one of many things going on with energy, but not a... Uh, all that important one. It's just it's signaling that there may be some price changes in one particular source of energy. Um, the stuff to watch is new technologies, not just in oil recovery. <laughs> and we are all paying attention to oil recovery, the, the screw up in the Gulf. Uh, but it is the case that uh, King Hubbard's original ideas about peak oil were based on a set of technologies that were in place then that have been you know, completely moved on from. So there are lots of important things to make decisions in, in relation to an important change going on. But in my view, peak oil is not one of them. And that's why it's sort of passed over in the book. Sorry, long answer. Oh. Um, OK, this, yeah. Hi. Uh, is this working? Oh, thank yeah, you. This question is for Ian. Um, Where are you, I, just so I can? Here. Just there. Yeah, right. well, how about standing I, uh, up? So then we can sort I of Actually, it's a good idea. Can you, can you stand up to ask okay. the questions? Uh, or this, uh... um, my name is Ruan McGann. I, I loved your book, Ian. Um, i just uh, wondering why Michael Beard had to be married so many times. <laughs> <laughs> well, at one point, he reflects that, um, that marriage is a series of drafts. You know, you're always trying to get it right. Uh, and he reflects that, uh, that his last wife, uh, who, who left him, uh, has married a man even fatter than he is. <laughs> and uh, that she's trying to perfect this um, vision. I, I was interested in the character who, who created chaos around him. That was all. I wanted a chaotic private life uh, for him. Uh, maybe as an encapsulation of the sense of uh, uh, of our own affairs, as it were, to put you know, to make a pun of it, um, I wanted to mark a private life against a, a public life lived in in this very self self interested and uh, greedy and acquisitive way. He's a sort of negative everyman in some sense. Well. You know, I, I don't think that everyone is or should be married five times. Not everyone is as greedy as Michael Beard. Uh, not everyone tells as many lies. Uh, it's a form of comic exaggeration, too, I guess. Okay, we have a question here, and then one here, and then I'm going to go upstairs. If anybody's got a question upstairs, just indicate and grab the mic. I think my question is going to be very similar. I was going to ask, did you have a certain perverse pleasure in creating such an obnoxious character as Michael Beard? So I didn't catch the beginning of that question. I think my question is going to be very similar because um, I was going to ask, did you have a certain perverse pleasure in creating such an obnoxious character as Michael Beard? Yes, I, I did have some <laughs> pleasure out of it, actually. Uh, it's a challenge. Every now and then one wants to make a central character who isn't. 
a hero, but an anti-hero. Uh, mm. uh, not everybody is, uh, is marvelous, and uh, sometimes you want to uh, bring right to the center. Uh, it's something of a rhetorical challenge, too, to uh, filter the world through the mind of an unsympathetic character. And uh, here I stand in the shadow uh, of another writer recently dead, who did it brilliantly, and, and that is John Updike. Mm. Um, over the course of the four uh, Rabbit novels, the Tetralogy. Uh, Rabbit Angstrom is a man of limited education, limited intelligence, uh, fairly unpleasant, uh, acquisitive, uh, rather shifty in his, and chaotic in his private life, uh, sleeps with his son's wife at one point, um, and yet, Updike manages to filter through this consciousness four decades of American social change, as well as uh, an extraordinary reflection on the sort of fine print of, of the private life. And ever since I've read and reread those volumes, I've wanted to have my own timid go of putting at the center of a novel uh, so, uh, something of a failed human being. But making him every now and then a comic victim so that I keep the reader at least, I hope, and it doesn't always work, but keep the reader vague, somehow attached to him. It's, it is a challenge, though. I mean, you know, we want heroes in our novels and movies, uh, but in fact, some of the great novels of um, plays of our time, uh, Macbeth, uh, Vanity Fair, I mean, there's, there are plenty of uh, unsympathetic heroes and heroines. Uh, People who are more like us. Yes, and, and, and just maybe one step on from us, too. Hopefully. Well, but the further remarkable thing you do that Updike doesn't really try, which is you, in your character, you see a physicist thinking about the things a physicist thinks about and thinking about them the way a physicist thinks about them and being clever. I mean, he's despicable as a character destroys everything he touches. Uh, but when you watch him trying to solve a problem or uh, arguing his, the physics side of some particular issue, Heisenberg principle or whatever, mm -hmm. he's an absolutely fascinating character to be in the mind of. And that's quite a thing to attempt since you're not exactly a physicist or even a scientist. Mm. Well, I think cleverness is morally neutral. Uh, being clever is not to be good or to be bad. I mean, there are some, um, um, I mean, we, people are distributed pretty evenly around cleverness, as, as well as stupidity. There, there are, um, you know, sainted fools, mm -hmm. also a, a very um, typical and powerful figure in, in fiction, the holy fool. Easier to write inside of, I imagine. Mm. But, it, I mean, I, it was a challenge. I could have made him a lot nicer and I could have had an easier time with the critics uh, in, in retrospect. Question over here. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just wondering, um, when you say literature is pessimistic and perhaps science is optimistic, I was just wondering, um, could you say that literature, when it seeks the answers it's looking for, let's say they're introspective ones, and when you have your first paragraph, the novel sort of evolves from that, so could you say that literature then is an introspective sort of search for truth that's inside of you? So you, you will find the answers if you, you write often enough. So it's optimistic. And that while science, because it's, it's reliant on the senses, it can't really find the truths that it's really looking for in the end. So it's really pessimistic. And that could you say as well that... Um, <laughs> could you say as well that since literature fixes and philosophy, which they're kind of related, fixes the, the root problems of human nature, like egotism and ignorance, while science really only provides the kind of, um, doesn't really deal with these root problems. It, it only really provides either really, in the worst sense, sharper and more dangerous weapons, or provides superficial, well not superficial answers, but answers that are still being managed by defective natures. Who wants to start off that one? 
the acoustics as far as Greg to be me, sitting in the middle. Wait, 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 how would you state the question? Because I didn't I'm sorry, well, I, quite I, understand I, it. I think that's very well put. Uh, there are all kinds of simple everyday things that science, although it sometimes describes them, does not enlighten them much about. I mean, in other words, two people uh, chatting about their lives over a cup of tea uh, could be described in a, a million ways scientifically, but would tell us not, as you say, the root of, of, of the reality between those two people mm. uh, that a novelist could. Um, I think the, the fundamental tool of science is, is, is uh, reductive, to break things down. I th and I, I'd never accept reductionism as an insult. I think it's one of the great tools of, of thought, about, especially about the physical world. Uh, whereas literature tends to be synthetic. I mean, it, it, it binds us to others' fates and binds uh, invented characters to their context, to their societies. And that's why we will always have these two magisteria. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, there are many ways in which science has invaded the territory of the novelist in the last 25 years. Uh, discussions in neuroscience about emotion or consciousness, mm -hmm. subjects that, that they never used to talk about, uh, not in the days when behaviorism ruled the roost, and talk about them fascinatingly, but they still do not displace the ability of a poet or a writer to give us the fine print of, of felt life, the qualia, the subjective, uh, the here and now, the flow of thought, um, the, the fluctuation of emotion, all those things, which require a synthesis. The synthesis uh, needing to be doing, done in a language that at least approximates the language in which we speak to each other. And science, inevitably because it's reductive, requires a special language, which repudiates, repels the, those of us who are not inducted. Well, apart from special language, a lot of scientists are writing for the general public lately. What do you make of that? Well, I think we've lived through a golden age of science writing since at least the mid-70s. <coughs> I've, I've benefited from enormously. I take an aesthetic pleasure in science. Um, it's much like the pleasure I take in music. Um, with Aristotle. I mean, it's, it's huge, it's big, it's, it's a wonderful literature. And we shouldn't think that being wrong, as it were, from our standpoint, would exclude you from this literature, because many people have to be wrong in order to save time for later people who are going to be right. Um, so, yes, we, there are uh, two or three marvelous anthologies of science writing. John Kerry did one. Um, there was another one just recently. Oh, Richard Dawkins did a, a superb historical uh, uh, anthology of science writing. So we, I think we need to love this literature. It's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Was, there's writers like Stephen Jay Gould, who was widely read. Among evolution biologists, I'm one, uh, he was actually held in relatively low repute. It was, it, it, he had a very strong theory, penciled equal punctuated equilibrium, which is not particularly proved out. But his books are wonderful to read because they're so damn well written and they cover a wide range of topics and so he had a wrong theory, so what? Um, mm. That's an interesting way for a, uh, a scientist to outlive their theories. Mm. Well, you know, you'd want to include Thomas Brown's Urn Burial and Bacon's Essays and Van Leeuwen Hook's Letters to the Royal Society. I mean, it, it's that it's rich, it's a rich literature. Anybody up to, yes, I think we have a question up there. Yeah, uh, 10 days ago, uh, Craig Venter announced the creation of a, a new synthetic organism, uh, Cynthia, as he called it. And um, it seems that, the, that this generated a huge amount of debate about the patenting of organisms and the commercial exploitation of synthetic organisms, and possibly a lot of it hype. But it nonetheless seems that the boundaries between science and commerce uh, have become extremely blurred in recent years. And I think that's something that really comes out in solar uh, as perhaps something that re is really troubling the, the, the moral status of the scientist as we've inherited it uh, in previous traditions of writing about scientists as these 
selfless investigators of the natural world. Uh, do, you, do you think that the merging of science and commerce is, is something that is challenging the moral nature of the scientist? Do you, do you yourself find it worrying or exciting what Craig did? Um, do I find it worrying or exciting? I, 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 I find it personally quite exciting, but uh, I, I suppose um, I, I find it also a wonderful piece of media spin and media hype. <laughs> um, but but I, I suppose there's a deeper question around the nature, the relationship between science and commerce, and uh, you know whether that's creating monsters like Michael Beard uh, that. Uh, that, that are, are really selfish agents, whereas we have this inherited image of the scientist as this, uh, the, somebody who's devoted uh, to uh, revealing nature's secrets. Perhaps that's a wrong image, but it's certainly something that we've lived with in the past, but there's something deeply disturbing and dark about the idea of a scientist who's motivated by commercial gain, I think. In case you're wondering, the question has come from a man who's responsible for the merging of science and the arts in the Science Gallery in Trinity College, and if anybody hasn't could be to see it yet. A great thing. I would recommend. I think Stuart would as well. Sorry, uh, science and commerce. Craig got in a lot of trouble. I, I know Craig Venter a bit and, and uh, like him enormously. There are people who think he's a Michael Beard character, that he's somehow despicable. And uh, maybe when he gets his Nobel Prize, he will be. But there isn't one in biology, so he, he may never be cursed with that. Um, Craig's story is a pretty interesting one. He, he wrote a uh, sort of a memoir, which is worth tracking down. Uh, he was a standard California surfer who wound up serving in Vietnam as a medic. And a, uh, as he said, it was mash without the jokes. Uh, <laughs> and he uh, you know, was trying to help people not die, and mostly they did. Uh, that's what actually happens in those places. They get only the desperate cases, and uh, they're often desperate for real reasons. And at uh, one point, as often happens with people uh, in these situations, became suicidal. And a uh, surfer, he was a very capable swimmer, and he, he set out swimming uh, into the ocean here on the coast uh, with the plan of not swimming back. And he got out there quite far and was... Um, frightened by a shark, and then thought, if I'm suicidal, why am I frightened by a shark? <laughs> <laughs> Who am I being frightened for? And then he realized, fuck, I'm about to get drowned out here, and uh, swam back to shore and just barely made it, and then lay on the beach, rethinking his life uh, from a desperate situation up. And basically, there and then, said about becoming the Craig Venter who could synthesize the genome of uh, imitating one bacterium and planting it along with more marks and so on, and famous quotes and things like that, and planting it in another bacterium and switching, changing it, total identity theft. Synthetic biology is what that domain is called. And uh, he spent $20 million from his own businesses doing that, and there is no direct financial payoff which will occur. What he wants to do, uh, and it probably came to him on the beach, is to basically go to the core of life and participate. And there are things that can occur from that kind of capability, curing diseases at a massive level, uh, being able to, one of the first things that will occur from this kind of capability is making a vaccine in real time to match any new potential epidemic like H1N1, if it goes uh, as virulent as it almost did, that if it went there, to be able to create vaccine in vast quantities that are specifically attuned to that pathogen. Well, that's something eminently worth doing. If somebody makes some money doing that, that's just fine with me. Um, I'm not particularly worried about these things being commercial. Um, I am worried about when companies like Monsanto try to overprotect uh, patents on naturally occurring genes. I think that's probably inappropriate. And also Monsanto uh, will bust, will come against legally any scientists who try to do research on their seeds in the field, which I think is absolutely despicable. I don't like it when environmentalists prevent research from happening. I don't like it when 
when corporations prevent research from happening. That's there the start. Is, I don't know. Is, What's your read on him? There is a problem when uh, an individual or a company gets a uh, patents what turns out to be um, a primary process which blocks off research right. for others. And I think we really need to sort that one out. Already, Salston's given a pretty powerful speech. Uh, and I think it's quite likely that the science community is going to do as it did before and wrest this uh, thing out of uh, Craig Venter's hands. And he will probably let go. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's extraordinary his journey from being planetary villain uh, to at least planetary semi-hero uh, in, in the course also, of 10 or 12 years. But I mean, I, I'm not sure we, we're going to, we, we say, when we talk about climate change, many people concede that we need some form of industrial revolution uh, in our sources of energy and many other things too. Uh, to achieve uh, some solutions. And an industrial revolution requires entrepreneurs and all kinds of charlatans will pile in. It will be very colorful, just like the last industrial revolution. Um, and um, as Adam Smith pointed out long ago, the baker does not bake uh, uh, out of uh, virtue and the desire to have everybody taste his bread. Um, he, he does so for profit and gain, and um, we have to accept that there will be brilliant individuals who come along with solutions uh, looking for um, monetary advancement. Uh, we do need these safeguards on processes, and I think that's really important. But I, we, we were talking about this earlier, that uh, there's a, a little piece in Stuart's book when he talks about the natural revulsion people feel about genetic engineering when they hear that a bit of a jellyfish has gone into a cucumber or a bit of a mouse has uh, gone in a, into a tomato. That when you take a gene, uh, he, he says there still is, uh, people still have a feeling that when you take a gene of a mouse, you're actually taking a tiny, tiny little mouse and putting it uh, into your tomato. And uh, Stuart reminds us that uh, the production, the cheap uh, synthetic production of insulin uh, is achieved by taking a human gene and planting it inside an E. coli bacterium. Now, immediately, I think what you think of is a tiny little person being plunged into a heap of shit. <laughs> and that it, it's unnatural. But actually, you're taking an instruction, uh, a bit of code, and uh, slightly altering the uh, structure and function uh, of an organism in the way that agriculture has haphazardly done for a long time. And I was quite impressed by the uh, anxious, uh, almost hysterical response to the uh, Cynthia matter when it was broached 10, 10, 12 days ago. Playing God was the, was the weary cliche. But I mean, geneticists are constantly splicing uh, genes uh, or devising viruses. Um, it's, it's become you know, cheap and easy. My son who's doing it at Cambridge says he can, he pays 35 cents per base pair um, for Great. when he's devising a, a, a virus. Uh, and in, when he started work uh, in October, it was 39 cents a base pair. So there you go. Mm. I have a question up here. Follow Follows up the last question. Um, thanks very much um, for the talk so far. Um, it follows up the talk on, on biotechnology. What about if and when this something goes wrong? Um, I mean, isn't it? There's, there's a risk equation there, and I think to some extent, from what you were saying earlier, you've you say that um, you know green greens have got it wrong. Could it be a little bit of both? Could there be a, a risk equation in that? Yes, there's huge risk in this biotechnology, and sometimes it will go wrong. And there's very little, I'm, I'm interested to know what your response then, as somebody who doesn't have a huge difficulty with it, in a situation where it goes wrong, and if it goes wrong on a particularly large scale, what your reaction is? Sure. Particularly in this part of the world, the 
often the precautionary principle kind of holds sway. It's even enshrined in law and some of the things having to do with genetically engineered food crops. And it, it started out honest. The precautionary principle was first used, uh, as I understand it, in, in the mainland Europe, uh, trying to, we didn't completely understand what was causing acid rain yet, but there was clearly damage happening, and so they uh, started being acting precautiously. And that somehow, which was the right thing to do, that somehow flipped into, with any new technology or technique or practice, if anybody can imagine anything that might possibly go wrong, and if they're ignorant, that helps, because they can imagine the things that uh, people within that world know can't actually happen, then you mustn't do it. And the idea is not risk balancing, which is real life. Uh, the idea is eliminating risk entirely, which is uh, impossible. And so it, I'm hoping pragmatic environmentalists who rise to the occasion of climate change and other things going on will realize is that, you know, does coal cause more damage than nuclear might if we had as much nuclear energy as we have coal-fired energy? And uh, when you do it in those terms, you realize that coal is already drastically damaging in terms of what it's doing with the atmosphere, not only with the CO2, but with the aerosols, and sulfur dioxide, the fly ash, the mercury that gets into everybody's food now because of burning coal and so on. And uh, you've now got 40 years of nuclear to look at, by contrast, you know, how many people have been harmed? Well, 56 were killed in Chernobyl. Uh, none died at Three Mile Island. I think none died with wind scale in Britain. And, um, well, you know, com compare and contrast. That's not saying go full bore with anything nuclear. It's just saying bear all these things in mind. And a pragmatist is going to say what actually works rather than what fits with some ideology or agenda or romantic stance or um, risk-free notion I have of a world that won't hurt me. One third of us are going to die of cancer. Uh, the way it is, it would be nice if Craig and so on can uh, fix that. But in the meantime, a little extra additives of radiation from this, that, or the other thing is not going to make a discernible difference. And when the United Nations went to Chernobyl uh, 12 or 14 years later and tried to see any signs of increased cancer, there weren't any. They couldn't find it. The epidemiology turned none up. So they uh, imagined that, well, you know, if a certain theory applies, 4,000 people out of 600,000 that were most exposed might die early because of a cancer. But it's just conjectural. There's no data to go on. So I guess both of us are saying, uh, you know, go for the data. Be cautious about things that are starting to be a problem. And, and so I propose that we have a vigilance principle that we apply along with precaution. And when we start getting a new technology, Craig's or whatever, we set in motion a bed of things that we're gonna watch for. And as they don't occur, then we can stop worrying about them so much. So when genetically engineered food crops first came along, people said, well, that's some kind of poison. And then everybody in North America ate a whole lot of genetically engineered food crops, and everybody in Europe carefully didn't. And you know, the results are now in. Uh, there's no difference between the two very large populations. So. It looks like it's not bad for you to eat this stuff. Now, something may turn up, and then we'll respond to that. I don't know if that speaks to what you're talking about, but I would love to see risk balancing as opposed to risk avoidance is the way we think about these things. Okay, um, two more questions, one up here, and then we're going to finish with uh, Frank McDonald. But let's just go up to the expensive seats for a moment. Okay, yeah, you both talked a lot about human nature and the challenges facing humanity. And especially, you know, Ian, you talked about um, how human nature stops things getting done at Copenhagen, that sort of thing. Uh, both or either of you, do you think that um, in the future, you know, um, when we have all these problems facing us in the future, do you think human nature will have to change? Do you think it will change in order to deal with the problems facing us? Or do you think it's kind of eternal and unchanging and we'll just have to guess around them being the same old humans? I think if human nature is a... Uh, I'm referring it to it here uh, as a biological feature rather than uh, something that's 
mutable, even though you know, famously you know, Virginia Woolf said you know, in 1910, human nature changed. Or, uh, and uh, it's, it's very common, especially in the humanities, to define a moment when human nature was transformed by this or that industrial wow. revolution or the invention of individuality or, or whatever. But I, I refer, I'm referring to human nature in the sense that, uh, well, Donald Brown in his famous book, Human Universals, a meta study of, uh, of all of anthropology, detailing what all cultures from Stone Age to, to modern industrial have in common. Um, and I don't think that does easily change. What can change though, and it's quite obvious it can, is, is human practice. And, culture is a very, very powerful signal and often overrides what human nature might, uh, might push us to do. And we see it um, in cultural difference, in the way um, people behave uh, in, from one country to another. So it's perfectly possible that although we have an underlying nature, uh, we can have you know, extraordinary mini revolutions uh, occur in, in our daily lives. And I think uh, and in my best moments, my most optimistic moments, I think the climate change challenge might bring out finally the very best in us. Because since no one escapes this, uh, we will have to learn to cooperate. We will have to learn to share our cleverness. Uh, we will um, change our practices. Uh, and I think it's already beginning to happen. Um, to take a small, I mean, small, my, a, a minor cultural revolution that's happened in all our lives in the last 20 years is the nature, say, of tobacco smoking. What an extraordinary and unpredictable matter it was in Western countries for it being weird not to smoke if you're an adult, uh, to becoming the other way around, uh, for it not to be a sign of cool but a sign of weakness. That's a great shift. Uh, and if you think that your own organism is a kind of planet which you could pollute at your will and then you get more information and, and learn that actually uh, you're doing, doing yourself irreparable harm and therefore stop. And then that stopping pushes through so that, and I speak as having been uh, a lifelong non-smoker. So whenever my smoking friends complain about having to go outside uh, in the pub, stand in the street to smoke. I say, we've got you on the run. It's our turn to be in the pub <laughs> while you go outside. Um, and I think the same can happen on all kinds of large scales. And that uh, There are practices now that future generations might look back in complete uh, amazement. Frank McDonald. I just wanted to ask Stuart, given his advocacy of nuclear energy, um, if you would, I think it has been glossed over, but yet I think it is the elephant in the room. What is your solution to the problem of, of radioactive waste and the incredible volumes of it that are generated? Um, I'm sure you're aware of Sellafield, the re, re, nuclear reprocessing plant in Cumbria. Uh, I remember being there and, and remarking to a taxi driver, uh, I know it's common for journalists to tell stories about taxi drivers, but this one was interesting and I just asked him as a local person uh, what did he think of Sellafield without being in any way pejorative and he said my family has been here for generations but if I had a choice I'd get out and I said did, do you know and I'm asking you now are you aware of the fact that there is for example over 60 tons of plutonium stored at Sellafield at the moment and the plutonium, as you know, is one of the most toxic and radioactive substances around. And it has a half-life of 10,000 years, which basically means, for the benefit of those in the audience who don't know, that at the end of 10,000 years, it is half as radioactive as it was at the beginning of that 10,000 years, and so on, ad infinitum. And to put that in perspective, it is less than 1,000 years since William the Conqueror won the Battle of Hastings. So are we not condemning future generations of humanity to look after growing volumes of plutonium and other seriously radioactive waste, and how are we going to do that if we believe in sustainable development? Do 
taking the climate change is for everybody for a long time if and when it occurs and the already existing trend is enormous we're already losing popul I mean, whole species of lizards for example just from the rather tiny warming that we've had so far um, civilization as we know it is actually under threat the Jim Lovelock version of the world which we had 55 million years ago, five degrees Celsius warmer, has carrying capacity for maybe a billion, billion and a half people. We're 6.8 now, headed toward nine. And then leveling off and heading down very rapidly. Um, that's the risk from climate. So what do you do to head off climate change? Well, um, geoengineering may occur. We haven't talked about that at all. But Mitigating greenhouse gas production is the main event. So lots of wind, lots of solar, lots of nuclear, uh, some more hydro, and then some other stuff we've got to develop, such as fusion. The nuclear waste issue, when I looked at it more closely, um, became went from horrifying to basically negligible, partly because of the sheer quantities. Um, if all of the electricity in your lifetime were to come from nuclear, the amount of fuel that that would require fits in a Coke can, uh, which means the amount of waste that comes out of that lifetime of electricity fits in a Coke can. Uh, if you get the electricity from coal, it's 77 tons of coal, which times 2.4 is a couple of hundred tons of carbon dioxide, which you personally are responsible for if you get that electricity from coal. The stashing of nuclear waste in, if we decide to do that rather than just burn it in the next generation of reactors, the integral fast reactors, which is, I think, going to happen. Uh, but if for some reason we decide to hell with it, uh, we'll just dump this stuff, then uh, geology is a really good place to put it. Uh, in New Mexico, there's a project called the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant which we've been putting nuclear waste in for 10 years now. It's a half mile down in a 3,000 foot thick salt formation that has been where it is for 250 million years. It's not going anywhere. Nobody's gonna go down there. There's plenty of salt. It's a 250 square mile formation, a salado formation. And um, we can put all the plutonium or anything else we wanna stash for a long time down there. It is the case that we're now in the process of de-weaponizing uh, nuclear warheads. And so America has quietly been rushing up, buying up Russian warheads and turning them into electricity for over 10 years now. And uh, then we'll start on our warheads and at some point, you know, Britain will probably want to toast its warheads, turn them into electricity. So uh, with what's called the fuel banking. The idea is that you get proliferation wherever nuclear energy goes is the opposite of the case. Where nuclear energy goes now, you get this kind of close monitoring of all fissile material, which means you can head off uh, not only the, new, the waste problems, if you go to some place where it's either stashed in the ground or reprocessed like the French, you also head off the possibility of weapons being made from the material. And thorium and other things that are coming along and fusion have no weapons capability at all. So both from the weapons standpoint and from the poison standpoint, uh, these are political issues, which are quite right to raise, but technically they're not uh, the problem that we thought they were. That, that was a big surprise for me, and the flip from caring deeply about nuclear waste to realizing it's a solved problem, technically, and then I can try to help solve it politically, that's part of the reason I spent time making a book like this. I hope that speaks to your Thank question. You right, um, unfortunately we have to give this lovely hall back. So we will draw the curtain, draw a mail over proceedings tonight. Um, Stuart and Ian will both be signing outside if you uh, want to purchase books and uh, they would be happy to sign. But uh, just if we would now, uh, our thank you to Stuart and to Ian, a round of applause.